Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for some of you. Welcome to the discussion forum archiving during the pandemic, Ukrainian heritage collections in Canada. I'm Marina Chernyaska, I'm the archivist at the Cool Focal Center and I will be moderating the first roundtable today. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge that the place where I'm speaking from today is located on Treaty 6 territory, traditional gathering place for many indigenous people, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our lives. I would also like to acknowledge uh, all our Ukrainian ancestors who came to Canada, worked hard, and persevered, cherished their language and cultures, and built Ukrainian communities that we know and are part of today. I invite you all to approach today's meeting with respect and gratitude to those who came before us, to those who were here before us, and in this way to contribute to building of relationships between people and communities, between archives and archivists, relationships that will benefit us all. Before we start, I would like to uh, say a few housekeeping items. So we have, we are expecting about uh, 70, a bit over 70 people to join from all over Canada, from Montreal to Vancouver. As far as I know, if you are further east or west, please let me know. We also have people joining from Ukraine, Belgium and Hungary. So welcome everyone. Uh, as you know, during the first round table, we will talk about archiving activities at the three uh, archival repositories. Uh, heritage repositories. Uh, we will discuss uh, different questions related to that and then the second row table will focus on different services available to community archives, um, Ukraine, Ukraine community archives in Canada. This first panel will be one hour and a half, uh, then we will take a half an hour break and reconvene exactly two hours from now for the second panel. If you're not speaking, we would ask you to keep your microphone off, which all of you, I think, are doing. Uh, you can keep your camera on. It doesn't really matter, as I was told, so please feel free. If your name doesn't show in the participants, if you scroll over your screen, you can see uh, at the bottom of your window different buttons. So one of them is participants. If you click on it, on the right hand, you will see, uh, Claire, could you demonstrate while I'm saying that? Uh, you can see the list of participants, you can find yourself and rename you. So, for example, Pani Nadia, uh, I know that, uh, now I know <laughs> what Pani Nadia it is, but it says Nadia's iPad, so we are not always sure who it is. So if you can please rename uh, yourself, if it's unknown, please name yourself properly. Uh, if you have any technical issues uh, or you would like to ask, ask questions, please click on the chat icon again at the bottom of your screen uh, and type your question in the chat. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat and passing them to the moderator, to me in this round table and to Natalia in the second one, and we will be asking them. If you choose so, you, you can raise your hand and ask your question uh, in person. Uh, again, when you click on participants, there is a button uh, on the right to raise hand and you can then lower your hand. You can ask questions anytime, starting from now, because people will be moderating and gathering them for us. Um, and basically that's it. We ask, the only thing we ask that you keep your questions short because we have many people, we have many questions and I hope we can cover as much as possible. Okay, it is my pleasure to introduce three, three speakers for the first panel. Natalia Misakovic, Olenka Skripnik, and Ashley Halko edley I will present all three people and then we'll get started. So Natalka Misakovic is a retired teacher librarian. She taught in the secondary panel. She has been involved at the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center for approximately five years. Her main contributions to the center has been working on digitizing UCRDC photograph collection and catalogs that exist in paper format. Our second presenter is Olenka Skripnik. She's a museum technician and administrative assistant at the Ukrainian Cultural and Education Center of Saredok. Along with the help of a dedicated group of volunteers, Olenka cares for the center's collections, which include artifacts, archives, fine art, and library. She also assists with exhibitions and public programming. 
And our third panelist is Ashley Halko Edley. She serves as the Cultural Heritage Specialist at the Cool Folklore Center and the Bogdan Medvitsky Ukrainian Folklore Archives. Ashley works on various projects at the archives in the center, including archival projects, research projects, publications, exhibits, digitization initiatives, public accessibility to archival materials, and others. Welcome to all of you, and let's get started. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask all three of you to uh, briefly speak about your institution, just to remind us all what it is you do and what's your mission. So let's start maybe going from east to west. And Natalka, if you don't mind starting, let's go from there. OK, UCRDC started in 1982 with the collecting of materials for a film called Harvest of Despair, which dealt with the subject of uh, the whole of the mall. When the film was completed in 1984, there was a question of what to do with all of these materials that were collected. So it was, um, a committee was formed and they raised funds, found a place to store the materials, which is uh, St. Vladimir's Institute on uh, Spadina in Toronto. And so the archive had its beginnings. And in 1986, the scope of the archive was widened to include the Ukrainian experience during World War II, Ukrainians in Canada and in the diaspora. Uh, since its inception, the archive has depended on the time and energy of volunteers uh, to process new materials, create catalogs and maintain the collection. Uh, one of the main activities of the archive is to, uh, the collection of oral histories from people who experienced the whole of the mod, uh, the DP camps at the end of World War II, uh, children of survivors of the whole of the mod, uh, the Vizinike, uh, and men and women who joined the Canadian forces to fight during World War II. So those are our um, major collections that we have at the uh, archive. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Natalka. Uh, Olenka, would you like to go next? Yeah, so um, the Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center, also known as Osaredok, uh, we just celebrated our 75th anniversary. We were founded in 1944. Um, so Osaredok is a public heritage institution with a mandate to preserve and share Ukrainian um, heritage in Canada. So we have a collection of archives, art, cultural materials, library materials that all relate to intellectual and cultural life of uh, Ukrainians in Canada and our communities. So, for example, we have material cultures, folk art, fine art, ethnography, community history. Um, when we share all that through public programming, so we have exhibitions, we provide tours, and we do um, activities such as workshops and lectures. Uh, and we provide access to our holdings to researchers and um, references to the public. Thank you, Alenka. And Ashley. Um, the Bodomovitsky Ukrainian Folklore Archives are located within the Cool Folklore Center, which is a center and institute within the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta. Uh, it was established in 1977 when Dr. Bodan uh collected and compiled the fieldwork materials from the first Ukrainian folklore classes. Um, and it's grown since then. We have a archival holdings as well as a non-circulating library, uh, special collections, and that special collections has some artifacts which are uh, generally part of a larger archival collection. Uh, the majority of our holdings uh, have been created from student fieldwork, uh, but we also have um, a large range of collections just about general Ukrainian Canadians and diaspora cultural life, not just within Canada. Uh, it's been growing over the last 10 years uh, a lot and it, uh, we have a number of collections uh, that the public can come and uh, look at. Thank you, Ashley. So let's, let's dive in. Given the title of our discussion forum today, Archiving During the Pandemic, uh, the idea was to get together and to share experiences that uh, some of them could be 
pleasant and exciting, some not so much. We are living in a very strange time. But uh, archivists uh, sometimes manage to make the best out of what we have. So I would like you all to share how pandemic affected your operations. Um, were there any um, challenges? Were there any breakthroughs that you managed to do due to the pandemic? So please share. And whoever wants to go first. I can go first. Okay, no problem. Yeah. We can go east to west again. Uh, well, during, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we basically had to shut down um, because everything was closed and we didn't have access to St. Vladimir's Institute. Uh, but once uh, things settled down, our uh, office uh, administrator was able to access the, um, the office. However, during the time that we weren't in the building, she was able to uh, work remotely uh, from home. And so basic operations of the uh, archive was able to be maintained. Uh, the volunteers, uh, we used to um, meet every Wednesday. So once the pandemic came, we were not able to meet anymore. And so a lot of our projects have been placed on hold because of that, because we're not able to physically go and physically uh, manipulate or, or work with the materials that, that we have uh, collected. Uh, but however, there are a few projects that are, uh, we are able to work with remotely. And so um, everything is, isn't at a stand, complete standstill. We're still moving forward. However, slowly. Okay, I think that's that's all we've had. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Osaradok also a lot of things with her operations had to slow down. I just noticed there was a question also that I'll address. Osaradok is in Winnipeg, Manitoba. We're here downtown. Come visit us. We're open. Um, <laughs> but. So yeah, when the pandemic hit, we had to close down and we were working from home. And that really affected a lot of our public programs. Like uh, we offer every year piss and sew workshops and we had to not offer those. We offer, we were going to do a Vishavanta day uh, celebration and we couldn't do that. Um, and then again, with the collections specifically, because of a lot of the work that we needed, to, we were doing with collections is uh, physical, like with accessioning things are here you need to see them like there's some work you can do at home but a lot of it um i couldn't do in my apartment so we started really focusing on planning things that we could do with the collections we were um like looking ahead at what when we got back what we would do um another thing that we did was or had issues with our operations as we do exhibitions and because everything was closing down, um, it was very difficult. It still is very difficult to plan an exhibition. Um, how many people can come in, how that affects numbers for openings. That's important for artists to have people come to openings and lectures. Um, but we're figuring things out. Like with Vishavan today, we actually had some people that work at the Cool Center do presentations on our YouTube channel. And um, yeah, it's been difficult, but we've been finding ways to work. And now actually, because Winnipeg is pretty open, we're back in the offices and open for the summer. Wonderful, wonderful. So are you actually, can people come and visit? Yes, so people can come and visit. Um, we, the first line of um, entry, I guess, is into our boutique. We're allowing four people in, or two people in the boutique at once, um, and then in the exhibitions, we are allowing four people in the boutique at, or in the exhibition spaces at once. We have two exhibition spaces, so you know there can be what's the math on that? Like eight people in the um, or ten people, public in the people in the building at once. We also do have five floors here at the Fedebuk, so that helps us with social distancing. No, it definitely does. <laughs> Thank you, Lenka. Ashley, would you like to step in? Yes. Um, so the university buildings um, closed 
in March for us very abruptly uh, and we moved everything online. Uh, luckily, we were working this uh, year on a project uh, with our research assistants and our research teams that was majority based uh, online and was able to be done from home. Uh, we were uh, working on processing our local cultures project, which is a project a fieldwork project that was uh, completed um, almost a decade now, ago now, um, or over a decade ago now, almost, two, sorry, almost two decades ago now. Um, and so it was quite smooth for us to transition home uh, and we were able to still have projects to do so that we were working. Uh, a lot of our physical processing did have to stop though, because we were not allowed uh, into our buildings, but as of June, we do have permission to come uh, to do some digitization. Uh, so we are still providing um, all of our reference services to the public, but nobody can come and actually physically work with the records right now, but we are able to provide online access. Uh, we did have some challenges earlier on uh, in that once the university uh, shut down all of their buildings, they turned off the ventilation to our buildings. Uh, which unfortunately for uh, archival records is not great for preservation because our uh, temperatures in our collections were uh, fluctuating. They were very high and then they would turn uh, the um, ventilation back on for about an hour, which would cool the space. And so the fluctuating temperatures weren't good. Uh, but we did able, we were able to figure that out eventually. Uh, but that was a challenge for us to figure out how to deal with that and um, move everything online. But we're now running fairly normal rather th other than the fact that we aren't here actually able to do our processing. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, both Olenka and you already touched on this already, but I would like maybe uh, if you could speak a little bit more about uh, how researchers can access your collections now if there is a reference question or if people want uh, to access some materials that they know which ones how do you address that and uh, Natalka do you want to start again so that uh, what uh, people we actually we have had two researchers actually uh, request uh, access to the the collection um, what they do is they email the office and they make a request and then uh, because St. Vladimir's is still relatively closed, uh, there aren't very many people there. So if they arrive one at a time, like we schedule the times that they arrive and uh, they're able to social distance because there's only one other person in this, or no, there might be a few more because the bus is there also. Okay, so, so there, there's a lot of area though for social distancing and then I believe that you, well, you have to wear a mask also, and uh, then they have access to whatever materials that they require. Thank but you. it's by appointment only. Okay, well, that makes sense. Thank you. Alanka? Yeah, so um, again, Winnipeg is in a kind of a little bit of a different situation than other places in Canada, but um, like, in regular times you have to make an appointment and we'll bring out the uh, materials that are needed. Um, this summer we have like a student that's working with uh, UCC National, like working with their archives. So it's um, luckily a lot of, I think like archival appointments kind of had already followed social distancing procedures, right? Like you had to make an appointment, you have to wear gloves, you know, so um, there's that. Um, and then, you know, we also have had, like previously to this, people from around the world, like especially Ukraine, a lot of people from Ukraine want to access our archives. So we kind of already have that process down as well, like people emailing us, asking for references, us checking what we have and what information we can give them. So yeah, it's been, um, it's been fairly simple this summer because we're just maintaining 
um, meeting times, but people aren't, yeah, a lot of people here at once. And, and we've already been doing it, like the social distancing thing with people in Ukraine for as long as email's been around, right? So. <laughs> That's true. And, and the general picture that, well, people who worked ever in archives, they know you always sit at the distance from other researchers. You're not encouraged to interact with them. You're encouraged to keep quiet, not no talking, and you're being surveyed basically all the time because exactly. you're working with materials. So yeah, you're right that it doesn't really make a huge difference now. I mean, it, there are complications and things you have to be more careful about, but I do think that, yeah, archivists are uniquely ready for this in that they already required an appointment. No drop-ins aren't, you know, too welcomed anyways, so. Thank yeah. you. I do have a follow-up question, but I would ask Ashley first to answer the question and then I'll get back. Uh, so during non-pandemic times, um, during the school year, we have uh, public hours from 1 to 4 p.m. But during the summer, it's always by appointment only. Um, and we encourage researchers as well to book an appointment before they come anyways, so that we can have the materials ready for us. Uh, there are kind of two routes that people can go about accessing our holdings. You can either uh, send an email to uh, our archivist who will, you know, see what we have and get back to you. Or we do have a online database, um, an Atom Access to Memory database, where not all of our collections, but a good number of our collections are uh, there with descriptions. Uh, so researchers can look up the materials that they want and then contact us with the specific materials. And then right now, because we're not open to the public, it's kind of, if we're able to come and digitize it, we're able to provide access to it, but it's um, all remote access right now. Thank you, Ashley. So for Natalka and Lenka, because you do allow researchers in at the moment, do you have any uh, period of time that, that materials are quarantined after the researcher uses them? Because I know in Europe in particular, they have a, a set number of days that they keep the materials in the quarantine after someone used it, and then they can provide access to the same material again. I know that we may not have a lineup of researchers wanting the same exactly collection, but have you, uh, do you have any procedure in place for uh, this kind of case? Uh, to my knowledge, no, we don't have a procedure. I know one of the uh, researchers, he was accessing interviews. So most of our interviews are digitized. So he would be using a computer to access them. So I guess we could disinfect the keyboard of the computer. However, uh, anything that's paper-based, um, I don't think we have anything, any procedure that to hold them. They probably stay out for a little while before we put them back in back where they belong. But other than that, there's no formal procedure. Thank you. And Lenka? Yeah, like you had mentioned, um, we haven't come into that question yet. Uh, we haven't had people needing the same uh, materials yet. But like I had mentioned before, it is helpful that you're wearing gloves and protective things anyway to protect the collection. So also protecting yourself. But um, yeah, we haven't had to really think about that too much yet. Okay, and, and thinking about access again, uh, so Ashley mentioned that if you digitize your material, you can make it uh, available to researchers remotely uh, through your archival database. Uh, Natalka mentioned that researchers come and listen to digitized recordings in your space. Uh, so can they access it remotely? And the same to Lenka. So do you digitize? You mentioned people from Ukraine. Do you digitize and email them to researchers or how do you deal with that? And you're welcome to just jump in, whoever. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we don't have a digitized collection right now. Um, like my intro mentioned, we have volunteers and we have a collections committee. Um, and the plan is right now, like a five-year plan, we're hoping to start digitizing things um, 
depending on grants and things like that. But uh, right now, uh, no, so if someone emails and wants um, access, they can either send someone maybe that's in Winnipeg to come down and do it on their behalf, or for a fee, we can also uh, do some scanning. But yeah, that's it's still kind of a little bit more analog than the digitized thing. You are an old institution. There, that's no wonder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Our uh, our digitization is spotty, and also um, what you can access remotely is also like there's certain things that we have available and other things that we don't have available so we are um we we are in the process of getting more digitization but for example the the Vizimic interviews that uh, this particular researcher required they're not available remotely so he had to physically come into our space and look at them through the computer that way okay thank you ashley would you like to add anything yeah, I just like to add that um, for our already digitized collections, uh, those we're able to just provide access to, but depending on the case for some of our non digitized records, there is sometimes a fee associated depending on the volume of materials. Thank you. Well, and uh, thank you all. Now, I'm thinking many people present here, uh, myself a little bit, we know your holdings a little bit. We know what you have, but if a person didn't know much, uh, do you have an online catalog or archival descriptions? How can people find out what you have or maybe published catalog uh, like people used to do it back in the day? Uh, how, how can people find out about your holdings and their content? Who wants to go first? I can go first. Um, I did mention we do have an online database. Um, it's not complete, but it's constantly being updated. Uh, so that's kind of our first place where I would send a researcher, even when they come in, sometimes we'll sit down together and uh, look at the database uh, to see what we can find before I go and look in other places anyways. So that's a great kind of starting place because you can look up specific records or you can look up a specific topic or you can just browse collections and see what there is online that sort of thing so there's lots of ways that you can just kind of come to the database and then from the database figure out what you're looking for. Thank you Ashley. Um, Natalka? Okay at, at UCRDC I think uh, most research could probably start with our website and see what kinds of things we have available through the website and then if they have questions they can either email or phone the office and the um, office administrator is uh, very knowledgeable or quite knowledgeable about the uh, collection so she would be able to field a lot of the questions that people might have. And then uh, also uh, we can refer to Pani Iroida Vinnitska and she knows everything that's in the archive because uh, she was one of the founding members of the archive. <laughs> so um, you have those, those kinds of access. Pardon? She doesn't know everything. She knows very little. You know a lot. No, no, uh, you know most of what's there. <laughs> thank you, Natalka. It's great to be all lost. <laughs> It's great to have yeah, Pani Ida um, here. Yeah. Go ahead. We have, uh, like, once you arrive at the institute uh, or at the archive, there are also uh, paper catalogs that, that have been created for, for uh, many of the collections. So you would have access to those catalogs, but you have to physically be in the center in order to do so. Thank you, Nathan. The paper catalog is much better than no catalog, that's for sure. <laughs> I can tell you. And, and both Bojana and Pani Ruida, I believe, are here. So kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you, Natalka. Olenka. Yeah, so um, similar, we have our website where it mentions the, our five collecting categories. So museum collections, archival collections, library collections, fine arts collections. Um, and then we do have paper catalogs as well. 
And like you had mentioned, there are these older published um, resources throughout libraries in Canada that, you know, will mention what kind of books that Los has or um, things like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are starting getting questions from the public and I will let you three rest for a minute. Uh, I will take the first one and I think I can answer it. Uh, Olana is asking, uh, does U of A have an, a, conne a connection with Mandare? I understand Brazilian Fathers Museum in Mandare. They have a collection of manuscripts, but don't respond to requests and don't seem to be open to any contacts. Um, I've been, uh, they have a, a single person who is responsible for their archives, museum, and library. Uh, so it, it's really tough because uh, Karen Lemiski is the person who, who is in charge, but she's the only one. So there is a ton of material. A lot of it hasn't been cataloged yet, and there is a long way to go. They do have wonderful collections. So I, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you were not able to, to, to uh, reach out to them, but uh, I think maybe I can help. Uh, I was talking to Karen just yesterday, I think, last time. Uh, the good news that I hope I have right to share about Mandare, uh, but it's really good news, especially today. Uh, they are hiring a librarian, a full-time permanent librarian, which in this day and time, I mean, it's an excellent news. I'm sure you would agree with me um, because uh, they recognize that their library is so big and so significant that they need a person dedicated to it full-time. So it means hopefully that Karen will be able to spend more time, to dedicate more time to museum and archives and uh, provide more services. Um, yeah, I hope this partially at least answers uh, Elena's question. Okay, next question we have to Ashley. Can the cool archives listing be accessed through the cool website? Ashley, I'll let you answer. Um, uh, yes, uh, they can be. There is a link, I am think, I'm trying to imagine our website right now. Um, but yes, uh, the, if you go to the uh, BMUFA portion of our website, it can be, or it can be accessed uh, at euchrefolk.archives. No. Marena, what's our website? Archives.euchrefolk.ca. <laughs> Archives.euchrefolk.ca. Sorry. We can, yeah, I can type it in the chat. Yeah, and then, so that's, that will show you um, our collections. Um, and then we're actually through that same website, uh, if it's uh, possible, we have, uh, are able to provide access to digitized collections through the website, but that would require uh, contacting um, us directly for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, I would like to, I have another question that I really want to ask you. Uh, now, during the pandemic, do you continue accepting donations? And if so, what is the procedure? Okay, I can start. Okay. Um, basically, what has been happening, we, have, we haven't um, had any physical donations made, but we've had a lot of inquiries uh, through email about making donations. And uh, so our office administrator, uh, she will then send out uh, a form that we have. Uh, and the form requires the people to um, identify what it is that they're donating and also to pri provide us with some context to the material that they're donating so that we can uh, have some kind of providence for the stuff, for the materials. And uh, we have only um, one, one person who is taking this very seriously and uh, eventually, I think her materials will arrive at the Institute or at the uh, set archival center. However, uh, we haven't uh, had any materials dropped off or anything like that. So we have inquiries, but no actual materials. And we haven't really thought about um, the pandemic with respect to materials, because I guess we should quarantine the materials when they arrive at the, at the, uh, at the center. But uh, that is uh, something that we haven't thought about. 
And you're not welcome. I know uh, when I first had to deal with something like that, especially because a lot of materials that we get, I'm sure all of us get, comes was stored prior to coming to us in garages or attics or basements. So archivists believe that it's a good idea. It's always a good idea to keep some to keep something in a wrapped, uh, closed space for several weeks before you actually start processing it. We were not all, always able to do that, but uh, yeah, that's that's a good question to think about. Thank you, Natalko. Uh, Lenko. Yeah, so we have been, we've started accepting um, materials into our collection. When it first um, happened, though, it was like people would email and we would say, we're not physically accepting donations right now but we can get the process started. So it's been actually quite positive for like things like provenance and uh, getting information. Because prior to that, people did often come without you know, an appointment and be like, here, I want to give you my uh, collection and you know, I only have an hour to talk to you or something, right? Uh, but now it's, or not even. So, but now it's been really positive that uh, we've been doing things like Zoom donation appointments. So someone can do, like show me what they have uh, from home and they don't have to bring anything in. They can, we can do that all at the most social distance, right, over online. Um, and then when materials do come into Osara book, because now we have started that this summer, they do go into a period of quarantine and we don't process them until like, several weeks later. Thank you. That's an excellent idea doing Zoom donors interviews. Yeah, That's excellent. Good. It's been so helpful and it's been a positive experience for me and I think for our donors as well, um, especially if there's any mobility issues or anything there's, that takes that away. Or if there are dozens of boxes that they need to go with their phone around that yeah, helps exactly. too, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, excellent. Ashley. Yes, uh, so we always uh, require our donors to contact the archivist with a donation offer before they donate materials anyways. Um, we always also require for our library collection and our phonograph collection, so most published materials, we require a itemized list uh, of donations, which we're still able to access our databases from home and go through to see um, what we may want to collect. And then for archival collections, uh, we're still accepting them. Um, we're not necessarily taking them in as much, uh, but people are still contacting us about donating them. And then depending on the individual situation, uh, if they can wait to donate them, we'll. Uh, wait because we're not doing any processing right now anyways uh, but if it's something they need to get rid of now they're the house is up for sale because someone's passed away or whatever then we're able to make those accommodations but it's always contacting us so that we can um, yeah determine the provenance determine whether it fits in with our mandate that sort of thing um, thank you Ashley it actually ties very nicely into Andrea's question um, understanding that space is limited for all of you, how do you decide what you can keep or what you can't? What kinds of collections are you most interested in? And it's probably related to my next question, what's your mandate? And I would like to hear from all of you because it will give us, it will help the audience and myself including understand better how these three pieces work together or overlap and so on. So please. Hmm. And I can, space, uh, I think we can interpret space both as physical and digital space because uh, preserving professionally a lot of digital materials is a lot of work and it's a very expensive uh, affair. So I, I would ask about both if you could uh, speak to both aspects would be nice. Okay. I can go first on this one. Okay, All right. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yes, so our mandate is generally very open. Um, in That's that a dangerous we, thing, you know that. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, in that we, uh, like, we're a folklore archive, so we're collecting everything about the life of 
Ukrainians and um, it's not just Ukrainian Canadians. Uh, we have materials from Ukraine, we have materials from Brazil, um, obviously materials from all across Canada. Uh, and so it's typically about the originality of those materials and how they fit in with the other collections that we have. Uh, we have a um, appraisal committee that looks through all of the materials and decides together uh, what we can accept and what we can't. And it's, I would say it's very individual for our materials. It's not, we automatically accept this, this, and this. It's about what can you tell us about the materials? Uh, where did they come from? What is the significance of them? And that sort of thing before we accept them because our space is limited. So we can't, unfortunately, as much as we would love to be able to just accept everything, uh, we just don't have the space to accept everything. Thank you, Ashley. And it makes me think how important uh, contextual information is for archives. As Alemka already mentioned, and I think Natalka as well, uh, if whatever you're offered, you don't know where it came from, who made it, and why, uh, it has uh, so much less value. Right. Thank you, Ashley. Who wants to go next? Natalka, would you? Okay, at, uh, at the UR UCRDC, I, our mandate began with the whole of the mod. And then once we expanded, we, we, we look at more of large historical events that uh, we like to collect materials for. And because we uh, do a lot of uh, oral history, I think we reach out to people in order to interview them and then once we have those interviews they're digitized so we have a digital storage problem <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what i was referring on, to so it, like we keep on needing to have you know more and more memory space in order to store all of this material um Physical material, we also have limited uh, space. So when we have donations, they're always, um, uh, we evaluate what aspects of the donations we can keep and what, what we, we don't really need. And so we either give those things back to the family or destroy it if they don't want it. Um, but, but that's, that's the basic process that we have. And I think we have to be like quite picky about what we accept and uh, from whom we accept it. So, you know, if it's really interesting and, and if it's someone who was really active in the Ukrainian community, uh, like we take all those things into consideration before we accept and process uh, materials into the collection. Thank you, Natalka. Malenka, would you like to step in? Yes, so um, it's much the same. We need the contextual information. Um, and then we also, we collect a, like a lot of a varied amount of things. So we're quite lucky here at Osaradok that we have a collections committee that is um, built up with like a lot of heavy hitters. We have Dr. Mirsav Shkundri, we have Dr. Robert Komash, we have Oris Marsnoros, Ben Hushok, James Komanowski, Dr. Stella Hanyuk. Ken Romanyuk, these are all the famous names. All the famous names. We're so lucky uh, to have them because they are all experts in various different aspects of Ukrainian uh, history in Winnipeg, in Canada, like internationally. So, yeah, we're really lucky that we can go to this committee and ask them for um, their expertise for what we can collect and. Yeah. Do you always go through this committee with all the donation offers that you get, or only selected? Um, we don't have to, but uh, yeah, they're there for our help when we need if them. You need. Okay, yeah. okay. We have two very closely related questions from the audience. Uh, so the first one is from Bogdana Bashuk. What, in your opinion, is the level of expertise required in order to make a decision on the collectability of any given archival material or museum materials? Well, I'll just go on because I was mentioning the collections committee. So um, I am the museum technician and I uh, have a good degree in art history and do these things, but um, there are these 
people that here at Ocerra Books that are like invaluable resource to us that help us with the credibility of what we collect. Well, and maybe we can add that those names that you, well, those who you named are historians, folklorists, and others, other scholars of uh, Ukrainians in Canada specifically. So they do have a very uh, close expertise knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, that's good that you have that committee. Wonderful. Uh, Ashley, Natalka? Uh, we're dependent on the expertise of our volunteers and the uh, historical backgrounds that they all bring to the table. Um, so we're dependent on, on them. Once they leave us, we're going to be in a little bit of a quandary as to our expertise. So we might have to want, reach out into academia as the uh, Winnipeg Centre has done. Having that kind of advisory uh, panel or committee, yes. whatever you call it, might be a good idea. Someone who is passionate and inv invested, but also knowledgeable about the, the subject of your research. Yes, wonderful. Ashley. Yes, so while it's definitely valuable to have expertise about, you know, the context of Ukrainians, Ukrainian Canadians, that sort of thing, I think it's more important to be an expertise on what you have in your collection. Uh, so we need to know what's in our collection so that we can see where the gaps in our collection are, where things fit in, what we already have so we're not accepting duplicates. Uh, and then also being somewhat of an expertise on the collections uh, in your community. So often uh, the question said both archival material and museum materials. So for example, we are not a museum. So we often get um, people contacting us and say, hey, I have this artifact, do you want it? And if we're not able to collect, to accept it, we then know what other museums are in our community, what other organizations are in our community and what their mandate is. And then we'll go, we can't accept this, but it may fit into the mandate of this organization. So let us connect you to them because it may fit in better there. Um, and so it's not just necessarily an expertise of knowing the subject material, but also knowing your collection and having a good understanding of the other collections in your community. Thank you, Ashley. And you basically answered the uh, next question from Irena, uh, Irene Jindrowski. If you cannot accept a collection, do you redirect it to other institutions? So thank you, Ashley, for answering. And I'll let Olenka and Natalia answer that as well. Yes, we also do that. If we cannot accept something, or if it's something that's too big, then we will also redirect to our whatever um, archive we think, or museum, well, I think mostly archives, we deal with archives that uh, would be able to use or accept those materials. Yeah, and we do the same thing. If there's something that doesn't fit our mandate, um, try to find an appropriate home for it. That's excellent. and. We can talk to you. So it, I, I think I think most of these referrals are happening locally, which is the most appropriate thing uh, in many cases because material usually originates in certain locality, and it's the best if it stays in the same locality. But I think it's also important that all of us keep in touch nationally because uh, yeah, something may work for you that we cannot accommodate. Yeah, that's good. Uh, you, you mentioned Olenka, Dr. Klemash, Dr. Robert mm -hmm. Klemash. I remember him visiting us and looking at our archives and that was 2009, I think. Uh, so 12 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, and he said that uh, the problem of many Ukrainian Canadian archives are that their mandates are too broad. Mm. So because all of us have limited resources, human resources, financial resources, space. Um, we don't have 10 professional museum specialists and archivists and librarians working in each institution. So considering all these limited resources, he recommended that he thought that the best idea would be if each institution, each Ukrainian Canadian heritage institution, a repository would have a narrower mandate, but that we all work together to uh, 
uh, in the end, preserve a big picture of Ukrainian Canadian life. And um, I'd like to think that uh, our initiative, the Sustainable Ukraine Canadian Heritage Project, is also another step towards uh, this goal. So I, I, especially now that we talked in person, I know who to call, I know who to email <laughs> if something like that comes up. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Sonia Tkachuk. Are you collecting genealogies of Ukrainian families? Uh, and if so, ha uh, have you asked Ukrainian genealogy societies in your area to donate genealogies to your collections? At UCRDC, we are not collecting genealogies. Okay, thank you, Natalka. Uh, no, we're not actively collecting them. We have a Eastern European Genealogical Society here in Winnipeg, and um, they're a great resource. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, we collect family histories. Um, so if it's a written, uh, compiled collection of a family history, we definitely collect those. Um, I would say not Ukrainian families, but Ukrainian Canadian families. Uh, we're not trying to take family histories from Ukraine into our collection, but definitely uh, Ukrainian Canadian ones. Uh, we haven't specifically asked the genealogy uh, societies to donate them, but we are in close contact with the uh, one here in Edmonton and whenever we can get our hands on one, we d usually accept it into our collection. Yeah, uh, I'll use my insider's knowledge here if I may. Ashley, I, I think I remember you told me that you worked with a researcher for quite a long time who praised uh, this type of resource highly. And I know that, I know our provincial archives in, in Alberta, they do not collect family histories. They do collect local histories. You know, those that were printed in the 70s and the, in the 80s uh, with the multiculturalism, but not family histories. So can you speak a bit to that? Yes. Um, so the published, like, uh, community history books, those are accepted, but these family history books are typically um, compiled by maybe one person in the family or a couple of people in the family. And yes, we've had lots of researchers that really like this type of material because it's not the, you know, the higher history of the community. It's more like individual about these people then you can get specific examples for researchers are finding specific examples in them and quotes and uh, that sort of thing of everyday life, uh, what that was like. Um, and it's a different type of history than a history book. And it's not, it's unpublished typically. So it's not edited. So it's not, oh, well, you can't say this, you can't say this. It's just, this is what our family history is. And yeah, researchers, I, I always point our section out to them. And I did have one researcher this year that just absolutely loved them. And he kept coming back for more. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Marika Dubek. Is anyone collecting church history archives? Uh, we received a donation from a gentleman, I believe he's from the United States, but he had traveled throughout Canada and the United States taking pictures of Ukrainian churches. And so he donated the, the pictures and um, a brief description of the churches, uh, who like who built them, who who uh, painted the iconostasis or or the um, the walls of the church. Uh, so he provided us with that kind of information. But uh, actual histories of churches we don't have, but we have that one collection. Thank you, Natalka. Well, Tarebis does collect like institutional and organizational um, and personal archives. So churches fall into all of those things. So, Do you have any? I know, for example, the, uh, the Orthodox, uh, they kind of keep their own archives in Winnipeg. So yeah, that can is, you name we, a few? We do also have um, the Orthodox consistory and the Catholic in Winnipeg. So those are places that have uh, great resources. 
off the top of my head, I'm sorry. I That's okay. That's okay. I was just wondering. I, I know that they don't have an archivist anymore for quite some time. He retired, so I, I would like to know what's happening, but maybe someone from the audience can update us on that. Thank you. Um, and Ashley? Yes. Yeah, so we do have like church history books uh, in our collection and part of our library collection. Um, I don't know that we have any actual church history archives as our collections. Uh, that may be one of those situations where we look at what other um, archives are in our community that may be better suited for that type of material. Thank you. All right. Um, before we uh, go to the next question from the audience, uh, I wanted to ask you and finish with the donation part. Um, can you share some stories? Because I know in private people do share this kind of stories when um, people just show up or just drop things off on your porch and then you find a new donation in the morning when you come to work. So something that uh, we can laugh at, but can also think about and be careful about. Is this during the pandemic? Uh, if you can specifically, go ahead. If not, generally works too. We haven't had any pandemic donations uh, that were problematic. <laughs> However, we did have one donation um, that was the collected papers of a particular individual and there was just tons and tons of materials there that had to be gone through and the the particular volunteer who has been going through it like i think sometimes at the end of the day her eyeballs were rolling around because there's just so much of it and uh, it's it's quite i don't want to say tedious but it it's it takes a lot of time and energy to to go through all of these papers i think it would have been nice if the family had done a preliminary look through and then and then gave us the papers but that's that's the way it is so that's one of the major donations that we're we were working on before the pandemic and then also we get books they just get uh the books just get uh they leave them at the door <laughs> when you come home, you come to, uh, to work. And uh, I know our office administrator often comes and uh, she comes in and uh, there's a box of books sitting at the door and you, you know, oh, what do we do with these? And so you have to go through them and, and all that. Sometimes it's, it's, you, it's useful what you get and oftentimes it's not so useful. And then you're scratching your head, what do we do with all this stuff? The books are a big one that like to get just get dropped off. Yeah, you're right. Um, so that recently had kind of an opposite of the horror story thing where uh, people just drop things off. Uh, I won't get into too much about like what the person donated, but someone sent a letter uh, with a donation and oftentimes that's like without context, they just send something in. But this one had a very nice letter that explained everything that we needed to know. I could call them back and let them know. And so it was, I mean, we do um, require donation appointments to make donations into the collection. But out of these kind of horror stories, quote unquote, it was uh, a nice experience. I heard a wonderful story about Osiradok, an unexpected donation, not dropped off, but I don't know if it's true, but I heard that an elderly lady showed up with a bag, plastic bag or something, and it was all full of paper money, which she donated to us at Edek. So I don't know if it's part of folklore yeah. of Ukrainian Canadians or it's a real story. I can't believe it. It is a real story. You know, it, I haven't heard this story. You I, should ask. Yeah, <laughs> I else. should ask. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, so I guess um, we haven't had any pandemic ones, but our main thing would just be kind of like public misconceptions of what our archives mandate is. Um, we're really interested in, you know, different aspects of cultural life, uh, but we want 
those interesting, unique archival documents, not uh, published materials or museum materials. And sometimes we will get researchers that come and ask us if we want all of their pisan kit and we don't, but then we hear they're like, oh yeah, we also had a box of letters, that, but we didn't think anyone wanted those, so we just tossed them, which is exactly what we want. And it's just sometimes hearing, you know, just people not understanding exactly what we want, uh, and then just offering us something, but then being like, oh, we also had this, but we don't have it anymore, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, many, most Ukrainian Canadians, I believe, had wonderful libraries, and now that they're getting older or they pass, it's really difficult situation because I don't know how about you, but it's so hard to throw away books. It's it's practically impossible. And yes, we I think we all try to find a good home for them. I know there are projects uh, that deal with sending books to Ukraine or other uh, Ukrainian study centers abroad, uh, not in Canada and not in Ukraine necessarily, but uh, as you know, it's expensive. But it, it's, it is a big issue. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I have a, would you like to add anything? Oh, no, I just wonder if I could address one of the questions I see coming in in the chat. Which one would you like to address? Uh, the Ukrainian Canadian music. Course. That's what I wanted to ask yeah. next, yes. Uh, can I just read it yeah. real quick? Okay, so Marika Dubek is asking, just one second, it's jumping. Um, if anyone is collecting Ukrainian, uh, Canadian music, Ukrainian records collection are going in garbages across Canada the time to collect and archive the history of Ukrainian music in Canada is now or never. So Ashley, go ahead and then. Yes, so we have been collecting Ukrainian Canadian music. Uh, we have a very large phonograph collection. Uh, and as of about two weeks ago, uh, our inventory of what we do have is uh, being completed. Uh, we have a researcher that has been working very hard on um, being able to tell us exactly what we have. He's looked through every single um, photograph in our collection and he can, we can now, um, we have a nice list that we can go through to see what we need to collect. So we, we are collecting it, we, but uh, we do work, that is one of our main materials that requires a itemized list before, um, donating because uh, sometimes people do have, you know, hundreds of these in their collection and uh, we just don't have the space to collect hundreds of duplicates. There are thousands of them in some collections. I just got a donation offer the other week. Yeah. Uh, Olenka and Natalka, do you want to talk to you about phonographs? Yeah. Um, have... Go ahead. Olenka. Uh, we have a uh collection of LPs in our collection uh, and yeah no we have a lot of stuff from like choirs um, locally and throughout Canada we have a lot of if anyone is familiar with Mickey and Bunny oh, of course of course <laughs> who isn't <laughs> and actually right now in our exhibition that was curated by Dr. Shkandri called Tradition to Modernity those are up on display uh, some of our collection of uh, LPs. Yeah, and if I may just in, in interject, uh, Bozelian Fathers Museum in Mandir is also finishing a project doing inventory of their LP collection. So they also have uh, apparently a large LP collection. So we agreed that we can swap the duplicates that we don't need and maybe something is missing in our collection. So maybe we can do it with all of us and make sure that, well, those few records that we don't yet have that we acquire them and this way we won't have to toss some. Okay, Natalka. Uh, we do not have a phonograph a collection. Okay. And, and we do not actively um, collect that sort of material. Okay. However, we are sponsoring a Ukrainian encyclopedia, no, it's an encyclopedia of Ukrainian folklore music, but it, uh, it, its focus is on Ukrainian, in Ukraine, uh, music uh, from the villages uh, that, that's being collected. However, physical phonographs, we do not have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, Bogdanovich says perhaps each institution could connect with their respective music list in order to come to one definitive collection to know that we've captured the true output of musical Ukrainian Canadiana. And uh, I would like to add to what Ashley said that uh, the project archivist who was working on inventorying uh, our collection at the Bogdan Medvitsky Ukrainian Folklore Archives, he's finishing scanning the covers. Uh, so we are hoping to post the catalog with the covers, with the pictures. This is much easier, as you know, to uh, browse through a catalog uh, seeing the pictures. So that would help, I guess, uh, both donors who would like to add to our collection, but also our colleagues at other uh, European Canadian archives who may um, have something that we don't end the other way. So definitely that's a very good idea, Bohdana. Um, yeah, I am uh, getting a bit lost because the questions are uh, getting large. I would like to finish with the church history first and then we'll move to uh, another question. So Vita Yakovlyva from CIUS says that the religion and culture program collection at CIUS has a small amount of material on church history in Ukraine and Canada, but it's a work in, pro in progress, uh, of course. There is a brief guide and there is a link in the chat. You can access it. And there is also, uh, yes, Vita shared two links. So we will save the chat and we can share it with the participants if you'd like. So don't worry if you didn't capture that. Uh, and um, I asked if anyone from the audience knows what's happening at the Orthodox uh, consistory in Winnipeg and we do have the answer. Uh, apparently they hired two archivists to organize the archives. Two phases of the project were completed a third phase was to start, but then funding became an issue and then COVID hit. Looking for funding sources with a view to restarting phase three when pandemic permits. Wonderful news, thank you. Uh, okay, Marika Dubik had another question and it's quite a specific one. Uh, Father Semen Izik was a, a concentration camp survivor and had no relatives in Canada. His archives were divided between Osaredo and uh, uh, Archie Parkey office in Winnipeg. His book, Smiling Through Tears, tells the Ukrainian priest story of a death camp survivor. After being rescued from the concentration camp, he ministered to Ukrainians uh, at the DP camp before coming to Winnipeg. I tackled down his book to a box uh, in the Arch Eparchy office. I listened to his Sunday radio programs while growing up in Winnipeg. The question is, I would like to know when Father Semen Isaac's archives will be copied and sent to the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv for study. His legacy must not be kept in dark boxes. I guess that's okay. for Olenka. Yeah, that's for me. Um, well, if you'd like to get into contact me, like contact with me, that would be great. I think that's like a larger question than I can give an answer to right now. So. My email address is Olenka at osarev.ca. Uh, thank you, Olenka. Maybe uh, if I may, I would like to comment on it as an archivist. Uh, it's not always um, it's not always a good thing to copy archives. Archives are valuable mostly because they are unique. So it might be a better idea to make them accessible through uh, some digital repositories rather than uh, just copying them because doing that work once, you make it available to the broad uh, audiences rather than, I, I know in the past people would do, copy their own materials and then donate those materials exactly the same packages to different archives, which kind of defeats the purpose and then duplicates, triplicates efforts because digitizing, processing, describing archival materials, as Natalka mentioned, going through those papers, we call them papirchiki, even if we speak English here, because it's like boxes of papirchiki, it means it, it needs months and months to you know, go through. So uh, thank you, Marika, for your question, and please contact Olenka if you would like to uh, address this issue further, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Andrea. Uh, you mentioned limited resources and your commitment and your comment on the limits of space. How expensive digitization is financially and in human resource? What do, you, what do your institutions need from the community to help support your work and ensure sustainability? Who would like to go first? 
I can go first. Um, we depend on donations from the community uh, to sustain our work. And we also uh, receive grants uh, from a variety of different organizations. Uh, they can be Ukrainian organizations, but also uh, they are governmental. Uh, so we get grants from the federal government and from the uh, Ontario provincial government to, um, to sustain the work that, that we have to do. So th those are our uh, financial um, sources Yeah, um, Osradok also is like run off of a lot of grants. Um, but what the community can do is uh, like be active participants in the programming that we put out. Um, I mean, first of all, it just helps us do, like um, fulfill our mandate and like makes the institution a healthier and better place. And we love to have our community with us. But then also from like this financial point of view, it does help with applications for grants and things. But an active and supportive membership is great. And yeah, you can always become a member at Osarazok and that helps with financial um, things as well. Yes, I will echo that, that coming out and supporting us, uh, attending our events, um, sharing our videos that we post, uh, our materials on the internet, uh, on Facebook, if you can, always helps. And financially, um, we do rely on um, government grants for positions for summer students uh, and for interns. And then also if we do have a project grants. We get a lot of project grants to hire people. We try to support our own graduate students uh, or um, our project staff as well. Uh, so financials always help. Um, I would guess, I'd say more generally, not just with our institution. I would say um, there's a need to fund also more permanent positions uh, across the country rather than relying only on you know summer students to come in and do work at many organizations um, four months is not a lot of time to train somebody and to have them complete uh, a vast number of projects uh, and so if there is kind of a drive for community support i'd be interested in seeing if we could fund some more permanent positions at organizations across the country so that these students who are filling these summer positions have uh, employment opportunities afterwards. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, Marianne, Philip Chuk is asking which specific grants do you apply for from the government? Um, we do Young Canada Works, uh, both their summer employment and internship for new graduates, uh, as well as Canada Summer Jobs. Um, the Young Canada Works one is specific for students, while the Canada Summer Jobs one is for anyone, uh, any Canadian citizen under, between I think it's 15 and 30, so under 30. Uh, and then we were relying also on the Government of Alberta's STEP program, but that has been canceled. Alain, can I talk We um, We apply to the same, uh, for the same grants as uh, Ashley does. Those, so they're the same ones from the federal government for summer students. Yeah, we uh, get funding from the city of Winnipeg, from the province of Manitoba, and uh, Young Canada works federally. Thank you. Uh, do you know about uh, COVID emergency funding that became available just recently and the deadline is coming uh, September 1st, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, well, you, you're not in your language, so are you applying? Yeah, yeah we've applied for that we've grant um, on all the newsletters that make. It's making sure that you know it's, uh, you can apply before September 1st. Okay. So you can Good. apply as early as you're ready to apply. Yeah, our organization has um, also applied for that funding. Okay. I believe we're applying also. I think our treasurer is applying. He mentioned something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, we have another question uh, from uh, Elsie. Uh, do any of your archives include sources for Ukrainian Canadian Ukrainian or Ukrainian Canadian dance history, such as social events, teachers, teaching, performance groups, and so on? And at least two of you, I'm sure, can answer that question. Uh, UC yeah. RDC. No. Okay. Thank you, Natalka. Ashley. Uh, yes, we do. Um, our uh, center's uh, director for a very long time was uh, Dr. Andrina Hachevsky, and his research focus was on dance. So we do have a lot of those materials in our collection. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, we also have some uh, dance history in our collections, um, like such as Rostalka here in Winnipeg. We have some of their archives. Um, I know Andy is listening. And would you like to add anything to that? Because I'm sure you know about dance resources across Canada better than anyone else here. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, we have actually quite a lot of on dance, both on uh, dance that is uh, social dance and also stage dance. It's uh, organized in some cases and in a lot of cases, some of the things are not organized yet uh, and accessible uh, to researchers. So there's, it's still a work in progress, um, but I think actually it's quite valuable. In particular, stage dance videos, we have a, a very large collection that's, that's uh, fairly systematic for Ukrainians in Canada, but also goes to mm, perhaps a dozen other countries of uh, Ukrainian dance groups in around the world. Uh, yeah, I think it's a fantastic topic. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Andy, for sharing. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, I see uh, Mark Kolovetsky would like to ask a question in person or provide a comment. Uh, Marco, would you uh, unmute yourself? Uh, basically, uh, uh, am I on right now? Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to do is, uh, I and I spoke with Marina uh, uh, yesterday, and I've, I've been in touch with her, so I'm coordinating a lot of this stuff through her. Uh, and she will be looking at some of the, the material that we have. But I wanted to let everybody else know what is available and what, whether they would be particularly interested in any particular thing. Now, I'm referring both to archives of Ukrainian news and personal ones. Uh, with Ukrainian news, we have uh, like the individual copies from about 1988 on, which will be digitized uh, through a project with uh, the Cool uh, Folklore Center. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of yearbooks. Now, um, the yearbooks are basically single copies from about 82 to 87, which, uh, 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 you know, we'll have to go to one particular source only. But then there's two or three copies of the, of the yearbooks from about 1988 on to, 19, to, to 2017 when I merged with the Neve Shrach. Uh, and I'm w wondering whether anybody would be interested in that. Other things that uh, could be available, and I will listen, there's a uh, number of photos from Ukrainian news, mostly from the 90s. Uh, the rest of it is it's all digital on my computers, some of which have uh, crashed, so that's gone. There's photos of, uh, uh, from my parents of uh, their life in uh, Winnipeg and Toronto in the 50s. Uh, some may be from Ukraine. There's some from Ukraine. I don't think they have any of the divisia because uh, they were, uh, destroyed all those. Uh, because my father didn't want to, uh, well, the fa my father did not admit being a part of the divisia uh, when they were, uh, uh, he came to Canada before they were uh, sort of cleared by British authorities. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, photos and costumes from Saharava, and of course books, um, Zaharava Theatre in Toronto. Uh, I don't know who might be interested in that. I'll be in touch with Saharava as well, and we have costumes. I'm just asking, is there anything that I've listed that somebody would be particularly interested in? Thank you, Marco. Uh, would any of you uh, like to answer? Olenka, Ashley, Natalka? Yeah, if you'd like to send me an email, uh, we can get that, we can talk about donation offers and that, that process further. 
but okay. thank you for letting us know what you have. Yes. So all of you Same would like here. to send you emails with my address. Yeah, if you could put that in an email for us and then, uh, like I said, there's a committee that has to meet before, so I can't make any promises. <laughs> Okay, as far as the Folklore Center is, uh, Marina will be coming over to look personally at everything that we have. Okay. Okay, Marco. Uh, I guess the idea is that we have to uh, keep talking and um, the I understand from Olenka what Olenka is saying and, and the other presenter is that when a donation offer comes, it, and I think I said the same yesterday, it's really good to have it in a written form because you can see uh, what exactly is being offered. Uh, this is why, because you said that there is so much stuff, this is why I suggested I come and have a look. Uh, but yes, starting uh, formally this conversation is a good idea. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, uh, Marianne Palachuk is asking, do you have lists of students or recent grads with background in archiving? Oh, very interesting question. Uh, would anyone like to answer? Uh, we don't have a list of names. I can comment actually, on that too, but uh, I would like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Natalka, continue, please. We're actually looking for an archivist right now, so... Uh, <laughs> we could uh, uh, use a list like that. Interesting. Yes, Ashley, you wanted to say something. Yeah, we don't have like a specific list, um, but most of our graduate students uh, do gain some basic experience um, working with archives. So if you looked at our list of current students or recent graduates on our website, those are people that may have uh, some of the experience that you're looking for. They all kind of focus on specific projects. So some of them may only have knowledge in one specific type of resource, but that would be a good starting spot. Okay, and Olena says, if the job can be done online, I'm very interested to work as an archivist, uh, PhD. So you can connect, I can, I can connect you if you would like to continue that conversation. Um, and Olenka? Yeah, we don't have like a list like that, but it'd be a great resource, I think, for the community to know um, what everyone's specialties are, what people mm -hmm. are interested in. I think that's a positive for everyone. I would like to comment on this one too. Uh, very often, at least at the Cool Focal Center, we need specific skills and languages are often uh, one of them. So it, of course, it's not about all the materials. Sometimes uh, you don't need uh, English is enough, but sometimes you do need someone who can read Cyrillic or understand Ukrainian or German or some other languages. So it depends. Sometimes we need someone with very specific technical expertise, someone who has experience working with metadata and specific software that uh, um, can, uh, so things like that. But uh, I always think if it's a summer, if it's a student position, I always contact our School of Library and Information Studies. It's a master program here at the U of A and uh, I can usually uh, find someone who is a, a good fit. I know U of T has iSchool and they have uh, archival stream there as well. Uh, also, University of Winnipeg is famous for their archival program. So uh, I think this is a very good resource uh, if it's uh, defined in time position, if it's not uh, more permanent. Uh, but do you need people with knowledge of Ukrainian or not necessarily? I would like to know that. In our, our, our archive, we would need people with uh, Ukrainian because an awful lot of our material is in the Ukrainian language. So okay. we would definitely have to have someone with a Ukrainian background. Okay, thank or you. Or ability to speak and read Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. Ashley? Um, not necessarily. Our positions aren't necessarily um, requiring Ukrainian. Uh, it often we need someone to be able to read Cyrillic and be able to transliterate that uh, if they're making 
file lists of whatever, but uh, also a lot of our material, the fieldwork material that's based in Canada uh, is in English. Um, so it's definitely an asset uh, and a requirement for some projects, but not all. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Okay, we have five minutes left. Last chance for uh, any questions from the audience. Uh, and okay, I missed one comment. Andriy Savchuk said, uh, and this relates to LPs and books, to our conversation about the, the, the number of uh, books and LPs that is being offered for donation. Uh, so he says that here in, in Ottawa, we have been able to ship LPs and cassettes I think books to, oh yes, to the Museum of Diaspora. Uh, I understand it's in cave, along with books. Shipment costs are an issue. Uh, I can imagine. Those boxes with LPs are so, so heavy. Yeah, shipping them must be really expensive. Uh, okay, thank you, Andri, for your comment. Mm, oh, I can add, uh, I'm on the board of the Pioneer, Ukraine Pioneer Association of Alberta, and we've been able to ship I want to say trains full of books. Uh, I'm probably exaggerating, but many, many containers of books to Ukraine, to Ostrich, to um, the Net University that is now in Vinnytsia uh, since the war started, to Ukrainian studies program in Korea, uh, South Korea. We started talking to people in Brazil, but that is not moving really anywhere. But yeah, this. There is a need for that, especially for literature published in the diaspora, because back in Ukraine, they didn't really have access, much access to uh, those publications. Okay, uh, we have another question from Marika Dubek. Is anyone collecting archives of PLAST or Zoom? I can answer about Alberta, but I would ask Olenka and Natalka maybe uh, answer first. Uh, we have some materials uh, from PLAST. Um, I'm not too sure about Zoom. And I also know that uh, the Plastovastanetia in Toronto, uh, they cleaned up their, uh, I guess their archives, I guess you could call them. And they sent a lot of materials to the National Library or the National Archive. National Archives, but but they are accepting, and Andri Suchuk can comment on that, but they are accepting only materials of national significance, so I would imagine only the, the national uh, plus, not yeah. the specific Ontario or uh, Toronto. Yeah, thank you, Natalka. Olanka? Yeah, we do have plus uh, materials, and we do have some uh, Zoom materials as well. Okay. Um, about plus in Edmonton, Stonetia, uh, plus uh, they have their own archive, and uh, Pani Nadia Tsensar is in charge of that. Um, I would ask Irene Jindrowski to talk about Zoom. As far as I know, she was involved in uh, processing that archive. Irena, can you please? Oh, maybe Irena can't hear us. And Andrei Sevchuk, uh, Irena? I uh, just had to unmute and un oh, yeah. put myself Hello. on video. Um, yes, the National uh, Executive of Zoom, their archives to a certain point in time, um, it's, it's not current, but they're at the Provincial Archives of Ontario. Um, and I know that the Edmonton Osaradoc archives are at uh, the Provincial Archives of Alberta. And I know that the National Executive Archives of Zoom, they have now sort of kept a certain amount of their archives in their own organization. So they're, they're storing them themselves at this point in time. So that's all I know. I don't know the Osaradke um, of Zoom, whether they have, uh, the other Osaradke of Zoom, what, what they have done. That's, so that's all, all I know right now. Thank you, Irina. Thank you very much. All right, we have one minute left. I would like uh, to give all three of you an opportunity, uh, if you wish, to say something to the audience or to each other as colleagues, something uh, that you would like to know or something that you wish you knew uh, or just wishes, please, please share. Hmm. 
Well, I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity to share all of these ideas. I think it's a real eye opener to, to see what other archives uh, and to hear what other archives in Canada are doing. And I think it's, a, it's been a very positive experience and I thank you all for it. Thank you, Natalka. Uh, we have a raised hand. One second. Yes, please. Go ahead. I would just like to say thank you for your session. It's been very useful to me to know more about you. And it's wonderful to see your faces, <laughs> not just words, not just the, your labels. So I thank you for organizing this this particular group. I will not be able to stay with you in the next session, but I appreciated this session. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you. Alenka and Ashley, we, we ran out of time really now, but if you would like just to say something, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I just want to thank you guys for organizing this. It's been great to uh, talk to everyone. I'm fairly new to my position here at Oceradoc, and so it's been really nice to get to talk to people uh, throughout Canada about collecting um, Ukrainian heritage. Thank you. Ashley? Yes, thank you. I really enjoyed this session. Um, I hope that we'll be able to make some connections from it and to work together a little bit. Um, it was really great to also see how much everybody's actually being able to still accomplish, even though we are going through a pandemic and we have all these limitations to see that work is still being done and we're all kind of moving forward with this and able to provide access to our materials. That was really reassuring. Thank you, everyone. We shall do it again. Thanks. So now we have half an hour break. Uh, I hope to see you all back in half an hour here. Thanks and see you. Enjoy your break.